Life Church created this podcast because we all need healthy conversations with real people. So this podcast is here to help you start real conversations with your life group, friends, and family. Now, on to the show. Hey, it's Jason, and I'm going to tell a story that has more to do with your life and my life than probably either of us actually know. But first, there's two tools that I want you to have while you listen. So the first tool is some kind of bag. Like for me, it's the bag that I bring with me to work. It's got a bunch of zippers and pockets and a place for my laptop. Yours could be a purse. It could be a shoulder bag. I don't know, grocery bag. Whatever kind of bag you're imagining, I hope that by now you have a good mental picture of it. The second tool that you're going to need is what I'm calling an open-eyed imagination. And this just means that you'll need to access and use your imagination with your eyes open in the middle of whatever is going on in your life. I hope it will help you to find Jesus in your life in a whole new way. Also, keeping your eyes open is pretty important if you're like driving or filing an expense report or chopping carrots or something like that. So I'll see you on the road in just a minute. And don't forget your back. Welcome to the You've Heard It Said podcast. This is Abigail. And this is Allie. And on the podcast, we are all about telling stories, right? We love hearing from our friends. We love learning from so many different voices and people. And today we're going to follow the same theme of hearing a story, but instead of it being from one of our friends or from personal experiences, we're actually going to be exploring a story from scripture. Yeah. I think for me, I can sometimes get into a habit of reading scripture and just kind of viewing it as like words on a page or like, oh, I've already read this story before. And sometimes I miss out the wonder of, wow, this is an adventure. Like this is Mm -hmm. not just like any other book. This is inspired by God and he can use it to teach us new things or to see things we've never saw before, even after reading this story. And so today I'm really excited because Jason's going to lead us through kind of an immersive way to look at scripture. And I think it's going to reveal new things that maybe you haven't noticed before and introduce a whole new way that we can approach scripture. So as you listen, try to find yourself in this Jesus story called the Emmaus Road. Okay, let's get on our way. Our story begins with the rhythmic thump of four sandal-clad feet of two travelers pressing again and again into the seven-mile road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. You might notice the earthy smell of a dusty road drying out in the Mediterranean sun. And we know, thanks to Luke, the author of this story, that one of the travelers is named Cleopas. The second traveler's name is actually left open. Maybe the second traveler can be you. That would definitely be using your open-eyed imagination, and I would like that. So the travelers, they're returning home from Jerusalem, where they likely went to celebrate the Passover. And soon we're going to find out that they weren't just in town for the Passover. They were there to see Jesus. These are actually early Jesus followers. In fact, there's a chance that they had cut and waved their own palm branches just a week earlier, hoping that he would be the one to finally deliver Israel. Theologians talk about this common hope that a Messiah would come and topple the Roman government and become their new king. And they could have been in the room for the Last Supper as Jesus broke bread and told his followers that he was going to be broken too. And they were almost certainly in town when Jesus was arrested and likely would have been confused that Jesus just gave in without mounting any kind of religious or political revolt that they had been hoping for. And they were there when Jesus and their hopes were killed. This is the road we're on. They're walking and talking about all of this, probably in shock and disbelief, maybe even arguing about who misunderstood Jesus and like maybe Jesus even fooled us. Maybe you've been on this road. Have you ever been disappointed by how Jesus did or didn't seem to show up in your story? Are you still carrying some of your disappointment? This is where your bag comes in. Go ahead, use your open-eyed imagination now. Look into your bag. What kind of disappointment might you be carrying with you? Maybe you think you're the only one who looks out for you. 
Maybe some other Jesus followers let you down. What are you carrying in your bag? So, they're just walking on this road, they're talking all this out, and a man just comes up from behind them. He's a stranger, he's an unknown traveler, and he butts into their conversation to ask a question. And this is from Luke 24, 17. I'll read in the message version. The unknown traveler says, what's this you're discussing so intently as you walk along? Can you imagine that? Like, you're at the bottom of your lowest disappointment. And some stranger wants to know what you're talking about. I love how the message version of Luke captures this moment. This is 24, 17 to 18. It says, they just stood there, long-faced, like they'd lost their best friend. And then one of them, Cleopas, said, are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what happened the last few days? The stranger looks back and he says three words, what has happened? three words. And then I'm going to read the response. It's in Luke 24, 19 to 24. This is the message. As I read it, try to think about what they might be feeling. They said, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, he was a man of God, a prophet. He was dynamic in work and word, blessed by both God and all the people. Then our high priests and leaders betrayed him. They got him sentenced to death and crucified him. And we had our hopes up that he was the one, the one about to deliver Israel. And it is now the third day since it happened. But now some of our women have completely confused us. Early this morning, they were at the tomb and couldn't find his body. They came back with the story that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of our friends went off to the tomb to check and found it was empty, just as the women said, but they didn't see Jesus. Can you feel what they feel? They knew about Jesus, and they were counting on him, but they didn't really see him as God. Oh, and then that line, we had our hopes up. Sometimes I avoid getting my hopes up, you know, just so they don't get down. In fact, that's in my bag. I have it like inside of a zipper, inside of a zipper is where I keep my hopes. Did you have any hopes up the last year that didn't go exactly the way you hoped? But this story, like mine and like yours, it's not just a bleak story. In fact, disappointment is evidence that you have hope. Uncertainty is the promise of a reality too beautiful for you to control. The kind of reality that requires a spirit-led, open-eyed imagination. We just heard the travelers tell about the women who said, Jesus, the one is alive. Could these travelers trust in this new story? Or should they just keep their hopes down inside of their bags? Then the stranger responds by basically suggesting that they don't actually believe their scriptures. This is in Luke 24, 25, the message. Then he said to them, so thick-headed, so slow-hearted, why can't you simply believe all the prophets said? He's talking about Moses. He's talking about Isaiah. And at this point, I think I would have looked at this guy and I would have said, excuse me, I am disappointed because I know and believe what the prophets have said. I mean, the Holy Scriptures said the government will be on his shoulders and instead his shoulders are hanging on a cross. But the stranger seemed to know the Scriptures better. And something about that felt strangely like hope. The travelers on the road are just beginning to toy with hope again. The stranger goes back to the beginning of their scriptures, to Moses, through the law and the prophets, and shows them why the Messiah actually had to suffer to enter into his glory. You can read it in the scriptures. If the travelers had been at the Last Supper for Passover, maybe they somehow started to remember Jesus talking about how his body would be broken like the bread and his blood would be poured out like the wine. Maybe they would have began to see why Jesus rode into town peacefully on a poor and lowly donkey without any military behind him. 
Maybe they were starting to see themselves in the way that the stranger saw their scriptures. Maybe they could see their story in God's story. The travelers reach their hometown at this moment, right in this moment of a new risk of joy starting to bud up. And they must be starting to wonder about who this stranger might be, that he offers hope that seems more real than their doubt. But the stranger starts walking on as if he has somewhere else to go. The Bible says that the stranger starts walking on Luke 24 28 he acted as if he were going on but they pressed him stay and have supper with us they could have clung to their bags of disappointment as he walked off but instead they invite the stranger to come with them to their town into their home at their table to break bread but instead of breaking bread and feeding the stranger the stranger breaks bread and begins to feed them and I just need to read this part from Luke And here is what happened. He sat down at the table with them, taking the bread. He blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. At that moment, open-eyed, wide-eyed, they recognized him and then he disappeared. Now you might hear the emotion in my voice and that's because I know, and you might already know, the stranger is Jesus. I didn't already tell you this, because the travelers on the road wouldn't have known it. But Luke, the author, he tells us earlier in the story, the stranger is Jesus. He's the real and resurrected Messiah. Maybe you already knew that about this story, but do you already know it about your story? I was talking to Lara, who helps with the podcast, and she told me two things. She said, first, don't ruin my favorite story in the Bible. <laughs> But she also told me that before the travelers realize they're talking to Christ, they start to realize that they can hope in Christ. They start putting their hope in this stranger before they know who he is. And she went on to explain herself. First, they hear from this man a reason to hope again. And then they realize that they're talking to hope. It's Lara. In the story of the road to Emmaus, we see Jesus come alongside two people, walk with them through their suffering, and provide them hope for the future. He was being a good neighbor. Jesus calls all of us to love our neighbors as ourselves, and we're all about it. At Life Church, we reach out to our neighbors in five key areas families, justice, education, well being, and community empowerment. We've created Bible plans for each of the five key areas, so if you'd like to learn more, just visit goto.lc slash neighbor plans. Do you know that you can read scripture this way? Did you know that you can pray this way? Do you know that you can live this way? Look into your bag of disappointment. Who are the strangers and unnamed neighbors? Who is there comforting you in your moment of pain? Can you see the resurrected Jesus walking around in the flesh and talking inside of your story? Jesus, he comes up from behind us to find us. He knows what's going on, but he still asks us what's going on. He listens. His life makes sense of the scriptures and our doubts and our hopes. But how? How did the travelers on the road see Jesus? And how do we open our eyes so that we can see Jesus today? I mean, did the travelers see Jesus because they remembered him breaking bread at the Last Supper? And so then when he does it again, they just remember. Did something really supernatural happen? Was it the scriptures themselves that Jesus talked through on the road that revealed him? Did they recognize him only because as he broke open this bread, they could see the wounds in his hands? Did they see him because they were hungry enough to let a stranger feed them? Yes. I think yes to all of those things. And also Jesus gives us another answer. In Matthew 25, he's teaching not long before the crucifixion, and he's telling anyone who will listen what it means to be like sheep. And people are like, what do you mean? He's talking about how to inherit the kingdom of God. 
And people don't fully get it, so Jesus starts to describe what it's like to be a sheep. This is from Matthew 25. He says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. The travelers saw Jesus because they invited him in while they still couldn't see him when he was a stranger. They were going to feed him, and instead they got fed by him. Who are the strangers in your story? Their disappointment, this king who surrenders to suffering, actually ends up being their deliverance. His broken hands breaking bread to feed us is our salvation, but loving others, loving the stranger. Matthew 25 goes on to talk about the prisoner. It talks about someone who's hungry, loving the people who we see as less than, that's how we see our salvation. We know the reasons for our hope, but do we know how to talk to hope? This is the road we're on. This is following Jesus. We can find Jesus in scripture and in prayer, and we can find him in the eyes of not yet known neighbors who don't yet look like him. It might seem upside down, but this is what happens when the savior of the world surrenders his life. This is our story. So where will you find Jesus walking and talking as you're on your way home? Next time you pray, or maybe even right now, Will you just look Jesus in the eye and invite him to take your bag of disappointment and use your open-eyed imagination and ask him to replace your bag of disappointment with strangers and neighbors and questions and new hope? I don't know about you, but I really loved the way that Jason just told that story and brought Mm -hmm. us into it with him. Mm -hmm. I was just reading The Road to Emmaus yesterday. And so it was really cool because I never thought to put myself in the story as like Mm -hmm. one of the travelers before. And it was interesting to me because after I read it, I started thinking about how playful Jesus is. Like, mm-hmm. I just think about that. I'm like, Jesus, that was kind of a punk move. Like, you're just walking <laughs> with them the whole time. And you're just like not telling anybody, like, I'm Jesus. And then all of a sudden, when he broke the bread, they realized it was Jesus. And it was Jesus the whole time. Like, he's with them on the road. He's with them while they're going through the whole story. And I think about how Jesus is always with us. We just don't always have the eyes to see or to notice. And so it just made me think about where are the areas in my life where I'm not noticing or I could notice that he's there the whole time if I would just pay attention. Yeah. And I think for me, it's noticing Jesus and also the people that he's putting in my life and mm-hmm. whose paths are crossing with mine. I love how this story is really turning neighbors and strangers into friends. Mm, And I think for me initially, that feels really nerve wracking because I'm like, how do I even, how do I do that? Like, do I just go across the street to my neighbor's house and knock on their door and ask them if they want to be friends? Because that feels a little bit weird, but also I want to be friends with them. I want to have good neighbors. I want to be friends with strangers. And so some of the practical ways that I think that I could start doing that is even just starting by inviting them over for dinner or out to a shared meal at a restaurant. I could ask them to do something for me if I need help with something or I'm trying to make dinner and I need like an egg and I don't have any eggs. I can ask my friends instead of going to Target right away. Mm -hmm. I could ask to borrow something or offer to share something that I have or even take them the leftover food that we have from dinner. I think all of those are really practical ways that we can start making our neighbors and strangers friends. Mm -hmm. I really like all of those ideas because I think it's things we do all the time. We just tend to consult like apps or figure out how to do it ourselves, and just bringing people into the stuff we already do. So as you get with your friends this week, your life group, your family, just talk about who are the neighbors or strangers in your life. And what would it look like for them to become actual friends? Hi, friends. It's Allie. And you know how we're always like, you can find the conversation guide in the show notes wherever you're listening. And you're like, 
cool. I don't really ever look at the show notes. Okay, if you do, great. Gold star for you. You can find it there. If you don't like looking at the show notes, we have another option for you. You can get it in your inbox. We can email you, and there's always some fun Easter eggs in the emails that make them very worth receiving. And you can sign up to get those emails at www.life.church.com. Thanks for listening and have a great week.